the Whistler 101 Sessions, a series that seeks to inform, educate, and inspire. Whistler 101, what do you know? Hello, my name is Jeanette Bruce. As a tour guide for the Whistler Museum and Archive Society, I'm going to walk you through the last 100 years or so of history in this valley. I don't have time to tell you every story, but I hope to give you an idea of how many innovators and dreamers have called Whistler home. Whistler's early history is as a unique shared territory of the Squamish and Lilwat First Nations, who used it as a trade and transportation corridor for thousands of years. In fact, a shared village called Spoez was located at the confluence of Rubble Creek and the Chequemus River. Wondering what happened to it? According to oral histories, Spoez was destroyed by a landslide in the mid-1800s. The first non-Indigenous visitors to the Whistler Valley were William Downey and Joseph McKay, who were commissioned by the colonial government in 1858 to explore the territory between Pemberton and Howe Sound for a better way to access the booming gold mines of the British Columbia interior. The route they established became the Pemberton Trail. By the time it was built in 1877, however, the gold rush was winding down and so it was only ever used by small parties. Whistler's first European settlers arrived just before the turn of the century. These were mostly adventurous men looking to eke out a living, prospecting, or trapping. One of these men was John Miller, also known as Mahogany John. Possibly on the run from the law, Miller built a small cabin at the junction of the Pemberton Trail and what's known today as Miller's Creek in Function Junction. He made his living as a trapper and by offering his cabin as a stopover along the Pemberton Trail. For 50 cents, you could sleep in a bunk and for another 50 cents, enjoy meals like muskrat stew or Stellar's J pie. While selling furs in Vancouver, Miller met Alex Phillip at the Horseshoe Bar and Grill where Alex worked. Miller told Alex about the high mountains, clear streams, and sparkling lakes filled with fish near his cabin. Intrigued, Alex brought Miller home to meet his wife, Myrtle. The Phillips had dreamed of opening a fishing lodge, and this sounded like the perfect place. Miller urged the Phillips to visit and see for themselves. In August 1911, the Phillips visited Miller at his cabin. It took three days to get there. First, by steamship from Vancouver to Squamish, and from there, they rented pack horses and walked for two long days. The Phillips fell in love with this area, and in 1913, they plunked down $700 for 10 acres on what was then known as Summit Lake. It would be renamed Alta Lake when the post office opened in 1915 because there were already too many Summit Lakes in BC. While Alex returned to work in Vancouver to finance the project, Myrtle, her father, and four siblings, the Tapleys, built the lodge, completing it in early 1914. In a stroke of kismet for the Phillips, the Pacific Great Eastern Railway brought train service to Alta Lake in 1914. Soon, Rainbow Lodge wasn't the only business in town. With the arrival of the train, logging and milling operations began, including the Parkhurst Mill and Logging Camp on Green Lake, which operated from 1926 to 1956. Although the railway's purpose was to improve resource extraction, it now took only nine hours to reach the valley from Vancouver, making tourism possible. The railway partnered with Rainbow Lodge to offer an all-inclusive package called the Fisherman's Excursion. Six dollars included train passage and a weekend stay. You could hardly stay with Mahogany John for cheaper. The first excursion in May of 1915 brought 24 fishermen. At the time, Rainbow Lodge had only one boat and two rafts, but everyone caught fish and went home happy. From that point on,
the lodge would have all the business it could handle. By the 1930s, Rainbow Lodge had grown to accommodate over 100 guests. Beyond fishing, guests could also hike, boat, picnic, and go on horseback rides. Whistler's first lady, Myrtle Phillip, was multi-talented. Lodge manager, cook, and one of the best fly fishermen around, she also set broken bones, rode horses, ran the post office, and served on the local school board for 35 years. In 1948, Myrtle and Alex sold the lodge and retired. Rainbow Lodge burnt down in 1977. Only three outbuildings remain, and you can see them if you visit Rainbow Park, built by the municipality in 1989. Now, tourism may not have been a priority for the province at that time, but it was clearly becoming a priority for the nation. The same year Myrtle and Alex first saw Alta Lake, Parks Canada was founded. The romanticism of nature and the outdoors were already drawing large crowds to American national parks like Yosemite and Yellowstone. In 1920, Garibaldi Park was set aside as a reserve, and it became BC's first official provincial park in 1927. Of course, many BC residents were enjoying their beautiful surroundings long before this. The British Columbia Mountaineering Club was founded in 1907. Members who summited Mount Garibaldi that same year were instrumental in convincing the province to establish the reserve in the area around Mount Garibaldi. The popularity of mountaineering continued through the early 20th century. Surveyors Neil Carter and Charles Townsend used Rainbow Lodge as a base camp while mapping the Spearhead Range in 1923. Carter and Townsend also made the first recorded summit of Wedge Mountain that same year. A man named George Burry had an inkling the area around Alta Lake might be suitable for a ski area, and he and several colleagues came to assess the region in 1939. Nothing came of the expedition, but Burry's instincts would prove sound a few decades later. Although people were experimenting with skiing in the area, it was Pip Brock, an Alta Lake summer resident, who made the first ski descent of Whistler Peak in 1933 at age 19. He joined forces with fellow ski mountaineering pioneers Don and Phyllis Mundy on a first ski ascent of Wedge Peak in 1937. But big peaks and difficult access meant skiing the high mountains around Alta Lake continued to attract only the very hardy. That changed in 1960, when California's Squaw Valley hosted the Winter Olympic Games, in an age when mass communication was just taking hold. Some Vancouver businessmen who attended the Squaw Valley Olympics were impressed with what they saw and thought they could do something similar. Forming the Garibaldi Olympic Development Association, or GOTA, in 1962, they began organizing to bring the Olympics to BC. Scouting for potential ski hills, Goda eventually chose London Mountain, which it renamed Whistler Mountain to avoid association with the foggy weather of London, England, and to honor the most vocal animal in the Alpine, the whistling marmot. In 1963, Goda submitted a bid to host the 1968 Olympic Winter Games. But Alta Lake wasn't really a town. It still had no proper road access, no power, no running water, no ski lifts, and no real ski runs. Unsurprisingly, their bid was turned down. A sister organization, Garibaldi Lift Limited, formed to develop the mountain with Vancouver businessman Franz Wilhelmsen in charge. In January 1966, Whistler Mountain officially opened for business at the base now called Creekside. With one gondola, one chairlift, and two T-bars. Local artists were hired to paint signs and maps. In true ski bum fashion, Isabel McLaurin painted many of the signs on the mountain in exchange for season passes for her family. An interesting detail of this map are the spaces left in the list of runs and lifts. They knew expansion was inevitable. 
Like Rainbow Lodge before it, Whistler Mountain became popular much more quickly than it was ready for. During this time, there would be many personalities forever linked to the mountain. It started when the first ski school director, Ornolf Janssen, brought wildman ski instructor Dag Abbey over from Norway. Abbey was a showman, explorer, and rule breaker who would jump off anything. Jim McConkie was Whistler's first real ski star, heading the ski school and launching heli skiing on the mountain. And there would be many other celebrity instructors and summer ski camp directors, among them Tony Seiler, Nancy Green, Wayne Wong, and Dave Murray. Everything was an experiment in the early days. So much innovation took place here. For instance, Ski Patrol had to figure out how to do avalanche control on such a large and wild mountain. Because Whistler already had heli skiing, visionary Hugh Smythe came up with the idea of heli bombing avalanche terrain, the first ski area in North America to do so. Fueled by the ski area's success, Alta Lake experienced rapid and chaotic growth. This makeshift town of 500 residents was governed by the Squamish Lillooet Regional District, but because it had never been officially incorporated, services remained rudimentary. Meanwhile, free-spirited ski bums who wanted to live on the cheap began to show up and occupy the empty buildings of abandoned logging camps. They also built their own cabins, often squatting on Crown land. This is a famous image from the time. One enterprising individual in this group printed 10,000 copies as posters and sold them on the World Cup ski circuit. So now you can find this image in ski towns all over the world. In the early 1970s, the provincial government became interested in tourism and moved to prevent uncontrolled development. The resort municipality of Whistler was created in 1975 the first such designation in Canada. This sounds fancier than it was since council meetings were often held in a garage. One of the first things needed was a town center. Several locations were proposed, but council decided on a prime bear viewing area at the local garbage dump where Whistler Village now stands. Initial plans for the village were fairly conventional, following a grid street pattern. Council didn't much like it, and designer Eldon Beck was invited from Vail to take a look. He spent a few days getting a feel for the landscape and was asked by government officials to draw up a plan. The original sketch looks a bit messy, but you can still see features that made it into the final design. Village construction officially began in 1978. Some businesses and new chairlifts from the village began operating in 1980. And by 1984, the first phase of building was complete. During this period, more terrain was opening on Whistler Mountain, which meant more lifts, including the peak chair in 1986 and the Whistler gondola in 1988. The village became the way most people accessed the mountain, shifting away from Creekside. 1980 was a big year for this town in other ways. It was also the year Blackcomb Mountain opened. Whistler Mountain was a popular, if fairly conventional, ski hill. Most visitors came from the lower mainland, and the lift company didn't invest too much in visitors' experiences off the mountain. But with its outside investors, Blackcomb brought a more corporate approach to developing both skiing and the lands around the mountain, leading to the creation of the Upper Village and Blackcomb Base. A popular analogy for the two mountains at this time was that Whistler was in the uphill transportation business, while Blackcomb was in the hospitality business. Blackcomb's crowd-pleasing tactics included serving hot chocolate in lift lines and clearing snow from customers' cars. Blackcomb also had 25 meters more vertical than Whistler, just enough to claim a true vertical mile of lift access terrain a first in North America, and a great marketing tool. Blackcomb was also the first of the two mountains to allow snowboarding. Eventual Olympic medalist Ross Rebegliati was the first snowboarder allowed up the lifts. 
The two mountains were partnered in attracting people to the resort, but there was also a stiff rivalry. If one mountain got a new lift, the other got a new lift. If one mountain hosted a big event, the other mountain hosted a bigger event. In 1997, IntraWest, a Vancouver-based real estate company that now owned Blackcomb and several other ski areas, bought Whistler and merged the two mountains to create the continent's largest ski resort, Whistler Blackcomb. Whistler had now completely transformed from a local ski hill to an international destination resort with the personalities to prove it. The Crazy Canucks captured the world's hearts during the 1970s and 80s with their success on the World Cup circuit and their fearless racing style. Local Rob Boyd became the first Canadian man to win a World Cup gold medal on Canadian soil. Stephanie Sloan earned a whopping 57 podium finishes and three championships on the World Cup freestyle circuit. She also started Whistler's first women-only ski camp. John Smart was a member of the Canadian national freestyle team and a two-time Olympian. He started Momentum Summer Ski Camps on Blackcomb Glacier in 1992. Ken Achenbach is one of the founding fathers of snowboarding and the man behind Camp of Champions. He also opened the first dedicated snowboard shop in Whistler, aptly named The Snowboard Shop. Mike Douglas is known as the godfather of free skiing. In the mid-90s, he and several other young skiers, known as the New Canadian Air Force, started skiing in snowboard terrain parks using twin-tip skis that would revolutionize the sport. These stories are a testament to the athletic innovation in Whistler, and mountain biking was another area in which this town was ahead of the curve. Blackcomb hosted the first documented mountain bike race in Canada in 1982. Early on, mountain biking could only be done as part of a guided tour. But by the mid-90s, local riders were building single-track trails on the mountains, and the Whistler Mountain Bike Park officially opened in 1999. World-renowned freeride cyclists like Richie Schley and Brett Tippy cut their teeth in the Whistler Bike Park and made it famous in magazines and movies. In 2004, Whistler Bike Park hosted the first ever Crankworks Festival. The bike park was largely responsible for a massive resurgence of summer tourism in Whistler. Whistler doesn't just innovate in sports, it also leads in infrastructure. The opening of the Peak to Peak in 2009 was a milestone, an engineering marvel that cemented the resort's reputation as an international Four Seasons resort. During this growth period, Whistler's Olympic dream didn't disappear, but it also didn't get very far. Bids for the 1972, 1976, 1980, and 1988 games all fell short. But around the new millennium, after unprecedented growth and popularity that included development of appropriate capacity, a new bid was submitted. The 21st Olympic Winter Games in 2010 are awarded to the city of Vancouver. On July 2nd, 2003, Whistler and Vancouver won the bid to host the 2010 Winter Olympic Games. After celebrating, Whistler got down to business, building a medals plaza, sliding center, Nordic center, and athletes village facilities that all became Olympic legacies. On February 12, 2010, the official opening ceremonies of the 21st Olympic Winter Games took place in Vancouver. Whistler welcomed the world and celebrated the reality of its long-standing Olympic dream. Today, a post-Olympic Whistler is coping with over-tourism, climate change, and deciding what comes next. Since 2010, Whistler has been searching for its post-Olympic identity and has broadened its attractions and activities to appeal to a more diverse visitor base. Folks who have never skied a day in their lives now flock to Whistler for a wide array of festivals celebrating film, literature, food, wine, beer, yoga, and more. 
tourism in Whistler is still booming with over 3 million visitors annually. And would you believe 60% of them arrive in the summer? Myrtle Phillip would be proud.